Uh, the other thing that I think, and I, what I really think we've seen over the last 20 years is a huge augmentation in the role of the forces. So we went from being a very um, peacekeeping force and uh, there were often times when I was in where we couldn't wear our uniforms off base because, you know, there was controversy around it or whatever, um, to, you know, fight with the Canadian forces. Those are the ads now, right? Um, and uh, so starting with the Persian Gulf War, I was in during the first Gulf War and Somalia and Rwanda, uh, but we've gone all over the world in peacekeeping roles as well as in fighting roles, um, most recently in Libya, though probably not the last one we'll see in the next little while. Um, and we're also called in for a lot of nat natural disasters, right? It was the military who uh, cleaned up after the Swiss air disaster in Nova Scotia. I'm sure many of you will remember that. Um, and in Canada's north, so we just, this whole past week, we've been hearing about the special forces exercise up north, and it's a real priority for the current government. And again, it's really unique climate to be working in, and physiolo your physiology has to change. I mean, you know, it's, it affects your physiology to be working in the cold like that, uh, and especially doing some of the stuff that our special forces do. Uh, so we do have some, some supporters and um, some, some big name supporters. As I'm sure you can imagine, Senator Dallaire has been an enormous supporter of ours. Um, and it, he did a special presentation to the Senate in, uh, about us and just talked about that the unique physical, mental, and social context of military service really defines how personnel, veterans, and their families deal with health throughout their life. So a lot of what they're seeing, you know, a lot of the impacts we see are trans, transgenerational in nature. And, uh, and most surprisingly, I think, is that more people have served in Afghanistan than served in Korea, which was our last major war that most people remember, and probably not many of us in this room were even born then. So uh, that's, I think, quite unique. I think the other thing that people have realized is that we really do have a social, <laughs> that we really do have a social covenant with uh, people in the military, that, I, that, that it's not the serving people who want to go into battle or go into war or go face atrocities around the world, it's the government who decides that. And when you're serving, you just, you go do it because that's what you signed on for and you're proud to do it and it's a great thing. But, you know, when these people are, are injured or wounded, it's now up to us to take care of them. I think the other thing that we're seeing uh, now, we're recognizing now, is that the range of injuries is extensive. And so a lot of what we see published is about the mental health, uh, mental health aspect of things. And what most of the research would tell us is it's about one in five who will suffer a mental health injury, which is not a whole lot uh, more than the general population. Uh, and so what's of interest there too is what makes people resilient. Why, why do some people get affected and some people don't? The physical injuries are tremendous and often very complex. And certainly in terms of cost, physical injuries are um, the highest expenditure for national defense and veterans affairs in terms of uh, health costs. And then we also see uh, complex stages of health over the life course. And so Veterans Affairs tells us that people come forward 10, 20, 30, even 50 years following service with injuries. And um, there is no typical situation. You can't predict it ever. And there it can be a latent impact. There really can be that this, this 10 years down the road, you realize something happened while you were serving uh, that, that is now affecting you. I think some of the other, th some of the other things about the new battlefield um, and challenges with life after service is the continuity of support. So as I mentioned, you're leaving a very comprehensive healthcare system and I'll give you a little sidebar here that enters into my research. So the Canadian Forces Health System provides everything for you. It provides all your drugs, any therapy that you need, everything is all, it, it, you don't have to pay anything out of pocket while you're a serving member. It's all covered for you. And they are the most cost-effective health system in the country when compared to the provincial system. <laughs> By about $6 per, they're about $6 a person cheaper 
than any other health system in the country. So I think we have things to learn from them as well. Um, they're used to a very high level of communications from their um, medical personnel and uh, the medical people are part of the team. They're part of the uh, whole team when you're in the military and so y you, know, you, you know everything about your health care. You know it all and so to, sometimes in our health care system, in our provincial systems, we're not, that we don't communicate that well. They expect to be taken care of well because they were when they were serving. They expect to be taken care of for life because they signed on the dotted line. Uh, and I think they often don't know what to expect from reintegration. They don't know what to expect. So for instance, when I went to get my OHIP card, um, I got a card for two years and I said, oh, I th thought they were good for five years. And she goes, no, 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 not for military or prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, thanks, appreciate that. <laughs> so <laughs> it's quite interesting. And I think part of, part of um, I should say, one of the other things is that sometimes when people have served, they, if they get ill later in life, they immediately attribute it to, to their military service, and that's not always the case. And I, I don't mean from a point of view where we shouldn't be covering that cost for them, I, I certainly don't mean that, but it sometimes stops them looking for the real cause of what's going on. They think, oh, that's because, you know, I served wherever and 15 people there already had that, so that's probably what it is, and they stop looking. So it's not effective either. I think, we, you know, so managing their expectations in that regard is important. Um, and I think what's really important is that we use evidence-based research to help, help, help sounds very pejorative, but anyways, you know, that evidence-based research is foremost in care of the military veterans and their families. Uh, and that we are proactive and responsive. So when we started this, Veterans Affairs, who does not have a huge capacity for research, they have a small research department and almost nothing to um, spend on external research. They're very creative, they're a, they're a powerhouse for such a small team. But they were still doing research on Agent Orange, which hadn't been used since the 70s because people were coming forward saying, oh, I was in New Brunswick and they used Agent Orange and now I'm sick because of it. So they were, they were having to be so reactive I, and ineffective. I mean, it, who would even know where to look? But um, so I think it's really important that we're proactive, able to predict if going into a certain part of the world. I mean, in this day and age, we should be able to predict what kind of soil, air, or water they're going to come into contact with and what possible issues might arise as a result of that just physiologically. We also want to uh, prioritize and coordinate and optimize resources. So we've got a lot of great researchers across Canada and part of what happened too when we started this whole institute and had our first conference was people came and we found, you know, three different pockets of research doing the same thing around the country. And all of them trying to approach national defense who is completely forbidden in dealing one-on-one -on -one with any university because of federal competition laws. And so, you know, they, they didn't know what was happening. And so, I mean, we need to optimize our resources. Nobody wants to be doing the same research or research as another guy across the country unless you're working with them. Uh, we have, I think we have a tremendous capacity of Canadian researchers. And this is part of what we wanted to gather together uh, in, in SIMVAR. And, um, and I mentioned about the arm's length research, very important that we have the scientists doing the research and national defense taking care of national defense uh, and, and that we can provide that arm's length capacity. We've also worked very hard on our international collaboration. So as I had mentioned before, we do have, um, we were the only one of our major military allies that didn't have an organization like this. So we've linked really closely with the organization in the UK with the organization in Australia um, and with several around the US. As you can imagine, the US has a ton of money to do this kind of work and many organizations, but we've linked with a lot of them. So I'm actually in a couple of weeks heading down to the White House to a big um, tri-national conference for Canada, the US and the UK. So we've worked really well and we always have, for any of you who've come to our conferences, we always have our international partners there and uh, with a strong presence. So that's really nice. Because a lot of what we see 
does does translate across countries you know some of the some of the health needs are common some are very unique though we have different training we have different equipment we have different lengths of deployment we have you know all kinds of different things so it's important that we have Canadian based research but why replicate something that would be universal uh, that we can we can work with so what are we so basically that's that's just a bit of background Right now, we're a network of 23 Canadian universities, and um, rather than list them on the handouts, you have their, the logos of everyone's at the bottom of the page. We do have universities in every province. Um, and really, our network members are the universities themselves, not the individual researchers. And the reason for that is it can be a bit fluid. Like sometimes, depending on the research, we might have a whole bunch of researchers at one university really engaged. Um, and then they might not be on another project. And we wanted to keep that as fluid as possible and open it to all researchers at all our member universities, not having to say, yeah, only these 16 at UOIT can participate because they signed off. That's not what we want, right? We want to access the Canadian academic community. And we really work as a conduit between academia and government organizations. And they, it, there is no doubt in my mind that part of the reason that we've had as much traction as we have is because I served in the military and so I can speak, you know, I'm an academic now, I know the academic world, I can speak academia, but I also know the military world. And I know uh, when to approach who, I know how to not upset people, but I also know how to go around the chain of command and they know that I know that. And so if I do it, it speaks volumes to them. <laughs> so it's, it's been good. I mean, you know, I can, speak, I can speak both languages and that's very helpful. I mentioned we're connected to our international counterparts. And we really saw our outcomes. We talk a lot about the research, but I don't think you can build an effective research um, enterprise without also having education. We are starting our first graduate course this fall, which I'll talk about and then knowledge exchange. And we actually started with the whole knowledge exchange thing with our very first forum, our very first conference that we had to start getting people talking and to see what research was out there. So I'll talk about that in a little bit too. Our main government stakeholders are Veterans Affairs Canada, the Canadian Forces Health Services Group, Defence Research and Development Canada, and the Chief of Military Personnel. And, um, What's really interesting is just in the last year, the Chief of Military Personnel has appointed two very senior officers, a Director of Quality of Life and a Director of Personnel and Family Support, who um, have it within their mandate to help support military families. Because there is, I mean, people understand that a serving member is not independent, that their family is part of, part of them and part of their health. I mean, we would all agree our families are part of our determinants of health but they, um, nobody really has any money for it, right? Which I in the government makes it a little bit difficult to translate into positive practices. So uh, I think the military works hard at providing resources, but researching them hasn't been a priority. And so they're very happy that we're here to help research what they're also providing for family. Um, I mentioned the international research institutes that, uh, that we participate with. The head of the Australian Centre for Military and Veteran Health will be at our forum this year. The head of the Centre for Military Health Research in the UK spoke at our conference last year. And we do have several people from the US VA and U US Department of Defence coming up this year to speak as well. And we do link, as I mentioned, very closely with them. So in terms of research, um, what we've started doing is we've developed a database of researchers with their interest on our website. And so we have some UOIT people up there along with our other researchers. And if you go into the search function on our website and, and type in trauma medicine, for example, whatever you're looking for, um, all the researchers who've listed that as a priority area will come up. And you can contact them at their various universities and say, hey, I'm putting, you know, I'm part of SIMVAR as well, and I'm putting together this research team to look at this grant. And people have really come together. And then they'll typically come back to us and say, can we get a letter of support? Because we're all SIMVAR researchers. So that's been really, really helpful. We have been able to connect researchers with some specific government funding. There's not a lot, but um, we do have 
uh, some contracts that come from the government and they were able to build a contract with Simvar because we're 23 universities, we're not just one. And so that's, that's very important. And um, we've uh, worked with our government partners to establish some CIHR funding opportunities. Uh, the new TBI Network Catalyst Grant that was just announced, Traumatic Brain Injury Network Catalyst Grant that was just announced, was in partnership with Defence Research and Development Canada and we were able to facilitate that. So we do speak with CIHR a lot to, to have them understand that military and veterans is a unique segment of society that needs to be focused upon as well. Um, and so there are a lot of areas and we intentionally, again, keep it very broad. Um, mental health, as I said, is probably the one we hear the most about in the media. And indeed, we just did a, um, one of my PhD students this summer just did a scoping review on li health literature that was speci published specifically about Canadian veterans and 95% of it's mental health. Uh, but there are, you know, obviously physical health and rehab is huge. Um, operational and environmental exposure and health. And we've just got them talking about now, we've got the military and veterans affairs talking now about occupational health as opposed to operational, which people didn't always relate with. You know, sometimes it's just, we all mean the same thing. Uh, combat casualty care, a transition to civilian life, and then uh, policy and program evaluation. Because there are a lot of programs out there that are well-meaning, but we don't know if they are, are evidence-based, right? They, they, they think they're good, and they may work in other populations, but we don't know if they're working in this population. So we do, we do absolutely keep it very, very broad. Um, in terms of education, uh, as I mentioned, we have a graduate webinar course starting this fall. So if our, there are any grad students in the room, it's open to uh, any Canadian graduate student who's interested in military and veteran health. It's offered jointly by Queen's and the Royal Military College, and, but you can do credits at other universities. You just work it through the grad schools. I don't know the exact mechanism of doing that, but I know it works. Um, and uh, it's through the Military Psychology and Leadership Department at Royal Military College and the Department of Community Health and Epidemiology at Queen's. Um, we have several family medicine residents doing their research projects in military and veteran health, and they are all military medical trainees, so, but they know nothing about the military, right? They get into med school, they get accepted by the military who pays for their med school, and then they, they come out, and they're as worried as anybody because they come out and they don't know anything about the military, so they're very excited to be able to do some research through us. And, um, uh, and we are building, uh, as we get more grad students interested in military and veteran health, we do plan to build an entire graduate program, but want it to be webinar based so that any of our partner universities can offer this to their students to have a focus in military and veteran health research. So I'm the director, I'm a professor at Queen's and an adjunct at RMC. And my associate director, Steph Dr. Stephanie Boulanger, is a professor at RMC and an adjunct at Queen's. Uh, so we do have that, uh, that nice link. And I think it's critical that we're linked with the Royal Military College, not the least of which is that, for example, for our graduate seminar, if you, if UOIT wanted to invite the Surgeon General to come and do a lecture, uh, he can't do that. He has to put it out to a uh, request for proposals to any Canadian university that would like to, I mean, this is federal competition laws, right? But the Royal Military College is the military's university, so he can go there and do a lecture anytime. <laughs> So he will be doing one of the lectures in our webinar. He's a wonderful guy. And, and uh, so just things like that. I mean, it's a great link for practical purposes as well as engaging the military. Um, and while I'm talking, um, the very handsome surgeon there in the bottom corner of my slide is uh, Colonel Dr. Homer Tien. He is a, the head of trauma medicine at Sunnybrook. And he is also a colonel in the military. And he was just named the Sir Frederick Banting Chair in military trauma medicine under our umbrella as part of SIMVAR. Uh, and he's a very engaged researcher with us. And actually, John was telling me at lunch that he was asking him some of the best questions he's ever had at a research presentation. So um, we're really proud of Homer and really pleased about the announcement. Um, in terms of knowledge exchange, we do have our website. Um, I'll put up the address in a bit, and I would hope you'd visit, visit us. We have our conferences every year, which I will talk about. 
We do offer unique publishing opportunities for all of our engaged researchers. So we've put out a book from the first two, we put out a book from the first forum. We have a book coming out this year from the second uh, conference. We have two special editions of the American Journal Physical Therapy coming out this year, focusing, it's joint Canada-US, but focusing on all areas of rehab, not just physical therapy, but we're doing a special edition with them, which I'm co-editing with Lieutenant Colonel John Childs, who's a very accomplished musculoskeletal researcher, if any of you are familiar with the name. And um, we do, uh, we also are able to, because of the link with the military, we publicize to the press a lot. And so often I'll get calls from the CBC or things like that and say, who's doing research in this area? What researcher should I talk to about this? So it's really nice that we're able to offer a lot of that now because we're in touch with the research community doing the work. Our government has stepped away from health care. They have said to the provinces, we're giving you your money, you do what you want to do. And um, so people, having the federal government focus back on healthcare has been a bit of a challenge, but military medicine is federal and veterans affairs is federal, right? So we are, we do have very strong links with the federal government. We've engaged with many, many MPs and senators. Uh, we have really strong support, as I mentioned earlier, from certainly from Romeo Dallaire, but Stephen Blaney, the Minister of Veterans Affairs, has been a huge supporter. He opened our conference last year, he will again this year. Uh, and what we did at the beginning, because we saw ourselves really at the clinical knowledge translation end, is we engaged with the professional associations. So we have really strong support from the Canadian Medical Association, the Canadian Physiotherapy Association, the Canadian Chiropractic Association, the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists, the Canadian Psychiatric Association, the Canadian Psychological Association. We can't get the nurses there, so any nurses in the room, talk to your association. <laughs> I don't know, we keep asking them. <laughs> um, we've also engaged with a lot of foundations, either charitable or research foundations. We work very closely with the True Patriot Love Foundation, who I'm sure many of you um, have talked to or heard about in the, in the news. They, are, um, they were formed by really a bunch of veterans from Bay Street who decided they wanted to do something to help military families and, and had good connections and were able to, they raise, they've raised now in the past, I think they raised somewhere between about two and $10 million a year uh, in charitable donations. And what we do with them, they, they sponsor an award at our forum uh, for the best oral presentation. And they, uh, they have asked us that if they get requests for research, would we vet that? So we have a college of peer reviewers, so we're able to help them with saying, yeah, this would be worthwhile research, or you know, the, our, our peer, college of peer reviewers does not believe it's scientifically sound. It's still their choice to make, it's their money. We've signed an agreement with the Rick Hansen Institute to work together on spinal cord injury research, obviously, and if there's anywhere you're going to go, it's uh, with, with Rick Hansen. There are only about six spinal cord injured, people who've suffered spinal cord injuries in service, so it's not a huge priority area for national defense, but they're thrilled to, uh, we're, we're now thrilled to have a link with the Rick Hansen Institute because if there is going to be any research done, we know they'll have access to the best research. And it was, and I, I got to go to a big political signing with Rick in Ottawa. It was really cool. Um, I had a lot of fun with that. He's, he's a very nice man. Um, the Neurological Health Charities Canada, they have a huge research group. They had about $15 million for research. So we've linked with them now and a lot of the studies are going to start focusing on military and veterans as well because in typically in pan-Canadian studies, military and veterans are ex excluded or if veterans are included, but not intentionally, nobody ever knows they're veterans, so there's no way of teasing that information out. Um, we work closely with other research institutes, as I mentioned, CAMH, a lot of the affiliate research institutes affiliated with the universities, by virtue of the university signing, they become part of us. The Royal Canadian Legion has been a big supporter of ours, and they have over 300,000 members. Um, and we were just admitted as a member of, to the Congress of Social Sciences and Humanities, which we think is huge because the, the focus, it's easy to get bogged down in the whole medical health side of things, but we believe the social side, I mean, it's all part of health, right? Health and well-being. And so we were really, we were invited um, to come forward for membership and we were accepted as a member in March. So we're very proud of that. Um, 
And last, last year, Minister Blaney held a conference with Ministers of Veterans Affairs from around the world and spoke about how important um, our institute was and the importance of sharing. I'll just let you read that. He's, as I mentioned, a, a big supporter. And so just a little bit of background. Um, we sort of came up with it as an idea. I was actually approached by a retired general who lived in Kingston, who had been my base commander when I got posted there. And he had a vision of starting a, a pan-Canadian um, institute, but focused on rehab. And I sort of said, well, you know, what about the research side? Um, we were able to get a meeting with the then incoming Surgeon General, who was just retired this summer actually, but he was incoming in, in 09, and absolutely said we need to engage with the research community. So we started engaging other government partners, and we held our first research forum, the Military and Veteran Health Research Forum in 2010. And we didn't know what to expect. I mean, we were just doing it as a fact-finding exercise, and we thought we might get 20 or 30 scientific abstracts. Well, we got 130, uh, and we had to, we had built it for 250 people, and we sold out three months before the event. And uh, we went to concurrent sessions, like two concurrent sessions, and just had everybody talk for 10 minutes and just whip them through, because we, we just, we didn't expect the outpouring. And I don't think the military expected it either, or Veterans Affairs. So we spent 09 and 2010 really engaging the universities with a bunch of the VPs research, including Michael Owen from here, um, about this initiative and moving forward and how are we gonna do this? Because this is very much a, a beast of a different color. Like this isn't like anything that had been done before. And it was remarkable. Uh, within the first year, we had 16 universities engaged. And as you know, now we're up to 23. Um, and uh, National Defense and Veterans Affairs said, yeah, we'll, we'll support you, but we need to retain arm's length. Like, we, uh, we'll advise you, but we can't be part of you, and that, that makes perfect sense to us as well. Um, last year, we had, we uh, upped our forum uh, numbers to 450. Again, we sold out, and we ended up, we, we now are at a stage where we get usually around 160 to 180 abstracts submitted, and we had 110 scientific oral and poster presentations, uh, lots of universities, and we, um, we sort of played up the political side a bit. We had a lot of the politicians there who supported us, but um, um, I think it was very successful. It was a really good networking opportunity, and for the people in the defense and veterans world to see that the academic community doesn't live in ivory towers, that we really actually do know what's going on and we can research things that are relevant to them. Um, and I think, because you, you guys know as well as I do, research has changed. It's not the one great researcher doing everything and people hover around him and everything stays in his university anymore. You can't get a grant unless you're a network. You, you know, you've got to have at least two institutions represented on any grant, if not more. So, I mean, it's just changed for us, and I think they, I don't think everybody knows that. So through 2012, um, we are continuing to develop the research program and engage our relevant stakeholders. Um, and we have our forum coming up, and part of what we've been focusing on the last couple of years is funding and sustainability, because we are not, we aren't sustainable yet. So I'll talk a little bit about the forum and then what we've done in terms of funding. Our forum this year is November 26th to the 28th. The um, early bird registration deadline ends on September 7th. So if you do think you want to come, I'd advise you to, or encourage you to register early just, just so you can uh, get in there. It will be held in Kingston again this year, um, though I, we anticipate starting to move around Canada next year. We have 400 delegate spaces and we typically save 50 VIP spaces for veterans that we invite as our guests to come to see what um, the community is doing for them. Oh, the call for abstracts isn't open, sorry. Registration is. Um, we always have a reception on the first night and a dinner. Um, we do believe that the networking sessions are really critically important to moving the research agenda ahead. And we have some outstanding keynotes. You can see them on our website. But we do have one of the top mental health researchers from Walter Reed Army Medical Center coming, Dr. Colonel Paul Blies. And um, one of the top occupational health specialists from Walter Reed as well, Dr. Colleen Baird-Weiss. So we're pretty excited about some of the speakers we have. 
Um, and that's our website, which I'll have up again. So for the research perspective, and I, I put this in because I think it's, everybody says, oh, you know, so where'd you get the money to do this? Well, we didn't. <laughs> we got some seed funding. My university took it on as a priority for me. I can be a little bit tenacious. And so my dean bought into it and my principal bought into it. And I got a little bit of seed funding to start up. And we have, as I mentioned, we do have um, a standing federal government contract. So we see a little bit of that money, not a lot, but it helps us a bit. We've been working with CIHR to see how we can help foster the research. Um, I don't want to build, I have no interest in building a big enterprise at Queen's. We have two tiny offices that were given to us and uh, in my vision we exist in the 23 uni universities across the country where we are. Um, and we've been helping to link researchers together um, and researchers with resources. So some people have grants and really just want access to the populations. And that's been really good for us because that's really helped get the research going and running. Um, in the long term, uh, so far two chairs have been um, uh, developed under the umbrella of CIMVHR. So there's the chair of clinical military and veteran clinical rehabilitation at the University of Alberta, which is now filled by Dr. Ebola Cernak. And she is a brain scientist who came up from Johns Hopkins. And she does a lot of work in traumatic brain injury, so she's one of the chairs. Homer Tien from Sunnybrook, who I spoke about her earlier, Colonel Dr. Tien, is the other chair, the Fre Sir Frederick Banting chair. Um, and one of our researchers who does a lot in a lot of work in saccadic eye movement as it relates to brain injury uh, from the University of Sherbrooke, Dr. Mark Corbier just received a chair and he's one of our engaged researchers. And um, we've just linked with the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College. We will be having a chair at Queen's University in our School of Rehab linked with SIMVAR as well. So we're pretty excited about all of those. We have had some uh, philanthropy and some donations, and that's, that's part of what we're looking at. Um, I, will, I will tell you that last year I was encouraged by my principal. We, we submitted an application to the Federal Finance Committee, and I did go to present to them, but as any of you who saw the budget know, we didn't get any money. But it was, it was a, a unique experience, certainly. And, um, and I'm not sure... I, I, We'll see how we'll see how things go with the federal government, but I'm just I'm not sure that they would prioritize giving us a bunch of money for it. I'm not sure that's realistic. So we keep looking at granting sources and sustainability. And and again, if we can continue to offer our books and our our forum and build the capacity around the country, I think that's what's going to make us sustainable. And I keep I'm working with some other universities to help establish chairs in that area. So if 10 years down the road, I'm still scraping together an operating budget, but we've got 10 chairs across the country in military and veterans health, then I think we've won. That's, to me, that's success. So, uh, because then it's there in perpetuity, right? Nobody's ever gonna take it away.